Hi, everyone, and welcome to the latest episode of Dissidents and Dictators, the flagship podcast from the Human Rights Foundation. My name is Casey Michelle, and alongside my co-host, Alicia Maldonado, say hi, Alicia. Hiya. We have a very special episode today. We'll be joined by Tanele Maseko, one of Swaziland's leading human rights campaigners and the head of the Tulani Maseko Foundation, named for her late husband, who was assassinated last year. It's a story and a movement that still hasn't gotten nearly enough attention, and we are honored to have Tanelli with us today, so stay tuned. Yes, Casey, as you said, uh, Tanelli Maseko is a Swazi human rights activist and she's the widow of, of Tulani Maseko, who's been a friend of the foundation for a number of years. And he was actually invited a couple of years ago, or in 2014, I believe, um, he was invited to speak at the forum, also Freedom Forum, and was arrested. And in his place, Tanelli came and read a letter that he had written while he was in pr uh, prison. It was called Greetings from Cell G4. And we can link that in the show notes. It's a really beautiful letter that she read. It, it, it'll make you tear up. And um, yes, and so in last year, in, in January 21st, 2023, Tulani was assassinated in front of uh, Tanali and her two young children while they were home watching television. And in this year that, that he's been gone, she's been carrying on his message, taking it to the regime of King Maswati. And she's going to share a story today. I think she's amazing. Uh, Tanali, hi. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, colleagues. How are you? Thank you very much for hosting me in this very powerful and very informative platform. My name is Tanele Masego, and I come from Swaziland, Africa's last absolute monarch. Thank you for having me, colleagues. We're so excited to have you. It's an honor to have you here with us today. Now, Tanele, where are you calling in from? Where are you joining us from today? Um, I'm, I'm not in Swaziland, honestly speaking. Um, I've relocated. I'm in South Africa. I'm in Pretoria. But I do go uh, to Swaziland from time to time because of safety. I'm in and out. Well, so let, let's back up for, for a second. Yeah. Obviously, it's, it's fantastic to have you join us. We're going to talk more about your work in particular, your late husband's work as well, and again, how that intersects with political dynamics in Swaziland. But tell us a little bit about Swaziland. I think a lot of folks still aren't necessarily familiar when they think of Africa, when they think of even, even Southern Africa, they don't necessarily think of what's taking place in Swaziland. You're from there originally. Tell us about and it. And we should also preface really quickly that it's now called Eswatini, but we do, we refuse to acknowledge it as such. Um, Swaziland is a very beautiful landlocked country. We live under Africa's last absolute monarch. That is, we do not have political parties. Political parties are banned. Political participation in terms of recognizing and having political parties is not there in Swaziland. That is number one. When I speak of an absolute monarch, I speak of one king, his family, his uh, cohorts, his proxies run the country. Now, I'm speaking of a king who's about 55 years of age, who has about 15 wives and a number of children. He is head of everything and ev anything. We have three arms of government. We have the judiciary, we have the executive, we have the legislator. So he is the one who chooses who is head of those three arms of government. He is the one who decides who is the prime minister. He decides on cabinet. Of course, we do have sham elections. We call them selections because you <laughs> go into parliament on an individual basis. Mm -hmm. That is, we have about 55 constituencies. Now, those are in the different communities, in the different regions in the country. We have about four regions. So in all those four regions, then it's made up of these constituencies. Now, you go into chiefdoms, where you appoint anyone in your community who you feel uh, deserves to go into parliament. So it's not like we have political parties. We, don't have, we do not have political parties in Swaziland. So that, in a nutshell, is how I would describe Swaziland. And we have a beautiful culture uh, where we only have one group. We do not have different ethnic groups like different tribes. It's only one. It's, it's, it's just. Mm -hmm. one ethnic group mm -hmm. so we 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 are correlated the population is plus minus 1.9 1.5 million so it's a very small beautiful country um he the king when i say he i mean the king controls everything 
When I say everything, I mean everything. He's into business. He's into everything. He runs literally the whole country. It is, it is, tonight, it is an absolute dictatorship. And obviously, it's not the only dictatorship in the world, but I think when a lot of folks think about dictators in the 21st century, they think of maybe military generals or, or certainly presidents or, or prime ministers that have been in power for so long and consolidated state power. I, I don't think a lot of people realize or even think that of course, a king can be a dictator as well, especially an absolute monarch. And as you said, mm -hmm. the last one remaining in Africa. He's not benevolent. <laughs> no, not at all. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, colleagues, really, when, when, when you think of Swaziland, people love coming to Swaziland because Swaziland is right next to South Africa. And, you know, you can travel by road, the, there's access. But in terms of governance issues in terms of human rights violations, in terms of the proper governance of that country. We, we, we do not have voices of dissent. Voices of dissent, human rights defenders, political activists, those are called or labeled terrorists. Mm -hmm. So we, we live under a total authoritarian state, yeah. if you want me to, 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 to describe it like that. So um, of course, um, if you come into the country, you'll think, oh, maybe it's a beautiful country. But if you dig deeper, you realize there's so many atrocities happening in the country, a lot of human rights violations that continue to happen. But because there's that grip over voices of dissent and political activists and human rights defenders, those people are silenced. Some are taken into prison. Some are in, are in exile. So people would then assume no, Swaziland is a peaceful country. It's not a, a peaceful country. Swaziland, people of Swaziland are silenced. And you've experienced that personally. We just passed the one year anniversary of your husband Tulani's assassination. Um, on the 21st of January, uh, 2023. Can you speak about who, you know, why uh, the king silenced him in, in such a drastic and terrible way? And, um, you know, because he did, he was speaking out, um, but very peacefully. Can you just tell us a little bit about him and, and his life and, and what he did um, so bravely? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Um, Tulani was a dedicated human rights lawyer. His activism started way back when he was still a young student in university. Um, I think when the winds of change were blowing from South Africa, um, he got the interest to really study and get to understand a better understanding of human rights and, and the law. So he was a qualified lawyer practicing in Swaziland and around the region. And Tulani would from time to time represent different people within the Swaziland landscape. Now, Tulani then started to realize that there's so many human rights violations that happen in the country. He started speaking out for those people. You know, he started speaking out for political activists. He started educating the community on what a basic right means. You know, the right to health, your right to education, your right to have land. So he did his work. And, you know, he serviced the poorest of the poor. He did labor law when um, different labor organizations wanted to register and government didn't want them to register their organizations. He was there in court um, assisting those uh, labor organizations. He was there uh, when people were killed. You know, in 2021, we had a string of, of killings. He was there doing the autopsies for those families, assisting those families. So Tulani was a selfless leader. He was a selfless human rights lawyer. Uh, but unfortunately, um, whilst doing his work, government didn't like that. Uh, it rubbed government the wrong way because when you are seen supporting the people and when you see me educating people on their rights, you know, uh, government didn't like what he was doing. He was very critical of the lack of independence of the judiciary. Also in Swaziland, he would write articles about that. And in 20, 2009, he was arrested, but then he was given bail. And then again, 2014, he was arrested. He served a sentence of about two years charged for contempt of court for merely writing an article critical of the, the lack of independence within the judiciary. Um, 
There also, uh, you could see that his right to freedom of expression was infringed upon. So he continued even after his release, I mean, through the help of the Human Rights um, Foundation, where we launched the Justice for Tulani campaign, where we sought um, for his release, and eventually he was released. So he, he did a lot of work around um, uh, illegal land grabs. He did a lot of work with um, ordinary laborers. He did, he did a lot of work around the country. So that was Tulani Masego. But unfortunately, mm. you know, as a human rights lawyer and as a human rights um, defender, I think government saw him as a threat because, of course, whilst doing his work, he then sought to ask government to say, can you open up the political space? You know, we seek to have political parties. That is number one. Number two, he said, civic space within the country is shrinking. Can you open up the space? Can we have an open dialogue? And he would engage government from time to time. So I think his call for seeking an all-inclusive dialogue didn't go well with the powers that be. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, on the 21st of January, at around about 3 p.m., His Majesty the King addressing his regiments, addressing um, the nation because he's normally in seclusion from October until January. So on that January, the 21st of January, 2023, he was addressing um, the nation, the Swaziland nation for the very first time. And you know, it's, it's one of the most important addresses, I mean, from the King, because that is where you get a sense of his thinking of the vision for the year. So the king came out very hard on, on human rights defenders. He came very hard on, on voices of dissent because he made a statement suggesting that he now has hired people to deal with voices of dissent. Mm -hmm. And uh, that he said it was around about 3 p.m. in the mm -hmm. afternoon. It was, a very, it was a very hot Saturday. Seven hours after that infamous speech, Tulani is shot dead in front of myself and my two boys in our house. So um, that is what um, we find ourselves in as, 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 as activists, as, as, as human rights defenders in Swaziland. And it's, it's not as if Tulani was calling for anything radical. I mean, radical in the context of the current political realities in Swaziland, but he's calling for increased political participation, mm -hmm. transparency, justice, rights, fair. I mean, all the kind of basic building blocks of a democratic society is what he was advocating for, doing it peacefully, and yet the king and his goons still targeted him and your family in particular. And I mean, it's very painful because all that Tulani did as a lawyer, he used the law. Mm -hmm. You know, our constitution in Swaziland has the Bill of Rights. And within that constitution, there is the right of freedom of expression. Mm -hmm. And Tulani used those tools you know, Tulani was one man when he saw an injustice. He was quick to make a court application, go to court, open court in broad daylight. And what is also painful is that the government of Swaziland, you know, continued without any shame, without anything, even after killing those victims, those ordinary people, mm -hmm. ordinary citizens in 2021. He did, the government didn't want to account for that. As government, you have a responsibility on your people. So, I mean, Tulani from time to time would try time and time again to say, in as much as we do not agree, but let's sit on an open table because that's right, we, we have that right as citizens to seek and ask for, uh, you know, a dialogue. So I think the government didn't want that because His Majesty the King, the word dialogue is, is, is something very, very, I don't know, I don't know how to describe it. He doesn't want that word because according to him, who are you to ask for a dialogue? Who are you? To, to hold sit me on a round table, you know, mm. to hold him accountable, and and really to to ask and to seek for a proper way of governance, you know, as citizens we have a right to choose how we want to be governed. So that right is taken away from us. Mm -hmm. So in a nutshell, that is what Tulani wanted to do. Tulani wanted people to elect a government for the people by the people, and 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 His Majesty the King does not want that. Mm -hmm. So 
I think that is where um, then, you know, they saw his interventions also with Sadak. Sadak is a, a, a it's a community, uh, it's a Southern Africa development community where all heads of state within, you know, the, the different countries within the Southern part of Africa, you know, meet from time to time and, you know, talk about issues. So he was beginning to talk to different heads of state around the Southern part of Africa to say, we have a problem in Swaziland, can you assist? So I think even that wrapped off the state in a very bad way. They didn't want that, they didn't like that. So yes, that is where we are um, with, 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 with Swaziland today. I think it's also just, you know, on a human level important to note or to highlight, you know, that, that I never got to meet Tulani, but um, he wasn't a, a pugilist. He wasn't uh, coming at you aggressively. He was a very soft-spoken man, and a, you know, and if you watch any of the talks that he's given, very soft-spoken and, and even-tempered. And so, who better to have a dialogue with than someone who's not trying to come at you real hard? And using what is already in the law, using yeah. the Bill of Rights, using what is already again there for everyone to see. Uh, but he's going up again against this absolute monarch who, as you said, I mean, this monarch has been in power for decades at this point mm -hmm. and doesn't think anyone has the right to come, up to, come to him for any kind of dialogue whatsoever. So how has this last year been? Yo, this year's last year has been, has been very difficult um, for the mass democratic movement in Swaziland, for civil society organizations in Swaziland, for us as a family, it has been very difficult because Tulani was this compass. Um, he was this backbone. He was this selfless leader who at any given point was ready to assist in any way possible. Now, in Swaziland, it's very difficult now because after Tulani's killing, I mean, the king made it clear to say, if you speak out, I have people hired for you. There is this one security company uh, called Beston Security Company that comes from South Africa. They are in the country working with the police, with security agencies. They are there in roadblocks monitoring the situation. So if you have those kind of mercenaries, as they call it, working in the country openly, um, and the king has rightly said it, if you speak up against me, I have people to deal with you and Tulani was shot dead and there hasn't been an open investigation. There hasn't been a progress report on Tulani's killing. So clearly people are now scared. They've lost hope. Can we, can we talk about his legacy, especially over the last year? So and I, I know I want to bring things back to you and your work as well, because Tulani wasn't operating in a vacuum. You know, he, the, the two of you together were such a powerhouse couple for making change, for making progress, and for creating community in Swaziland, as well as elsewhere. Obviously, you're part of the Human Rights Foundation's family. Can you tell us about the foundation, the Tulani Maseko Foundation, which you're now the, uh, I believe, the CEO of, correct? <laughs> you are correct. You are very much correct. You know, the, the Tulani Maseko Foundation is a legacy foundation that will drive and continue with the work that Tulani was doing. You know, Tulani had a lot of interest in public litigation. Tulani believed in an all-inclusive dialogue, which is also at the core of the Tulani Masego Foundation. And I mean, having Tulani interested in public litigation, there are so many issues happening within the country, the lack of, of uh, education, the system is crumbling. So we are also looking into bringing in lawyers, young lawyers, to come into the Tulani Masego Foundation so that they continue with the public litigation, the cases that Tulani was doing of public interest, that's number one. But number two, when I talk about an all-inclusive dialogue, Tulani was engaging different traditional leaders within, within uh, the Sadak region to say, let's have an open and honest dialogue in issues of governance. So that also will be part of um, the Tulani Masego uh, Foundation where we will host different dialogues in different countries. Zimbabwe is also a ticking time bomb. We'll go into that space, have open engagements with different leaders to best see how we can create our own democracy as Africans. So that is also part of the Tulani Masego legacy work that will continue. We're also looking at um, 
bringing into the space um, widows and, 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 and orphans because most of the time as human rights defenders, whilst on the line of duty, you find that you are now left as a spouse to take care of these kids. So um, it will also look at the social, uh, the psychological support mm -hmm. of, of widows and children. It will also be a solidarity center where we will from time to time have solidarity missions to different countries. I mean, there's a lot of atrocities happening within Africa. So also the Tulani Masego Foundation will be that solidarity center where we'll be on missions to show solidarity with different activists, with different women human rights activists, Activist. And also, the Tulani Masego Foundation will also mentor young lawyers, mm -hmm. mentor young political activists in terms of getting scholarships for them to empower these, uh, these HRDs and these political activists as they go about their work, they should be empowered. So the Tulani Masego Foundation will continue the work that Tulani had started as a leader and as a lawyer. And it's a legacy that is, again, not just contained to Swaziland itself. Obviously, that is where it is most prominent. But even just in the past year, you see it growing and growing and growing, as you were just talking about, Tanel. I mean, I remember coming across Delani's name for the first time when he was awarded the, um, what was it, the Outstanding Human Rights Lawyer Award from uh, the Magnitsky, uh, the Magnitsky Awards, which is, you know, I'm, I'm coming from kind of a Russian background, so that's how mm -hmm. I first discovered Delani, and all of a sudden I, I got to learn more about his work, and obviously I'm sure plenty of others uh, were able to intersect with his work there, but it, you see this legacy this 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 uh, uh, championing of basic rights extending beyond Swaziland, extending beyond Southern Africa, um, which I have to imagine is only going to continue. I mean, do we see? I, I hesitate to ask if you're optimistic about that, but I imagine what you were just talking about, Tanelli. You see these new voices, new generations, new organizations outside of Swaziland realizing what kind of impact and legacy he had and continues to have uh, even a year later. And I mean, colleagues, it, it, it's beautiful how, of course, was said Tulani was killed in the manner that he was because of standing for the truth and for standing for the rule of law, for social justice, for democracy. But in killing Tulani, the government of Swaziland didn't realize that they are creating many other Tulanis because mm -hmm. after his killing, you know, in Swaziland, I have young political students, law students, political activists coming to say, how can we assist? We want to volunteer within the Tulani Masego Foundation. What can we do? How can, can we amplify Tulani's voice beyond the grave? So you can see that in his killing, they thought they were silencing the person. Mm -hmm. And yet they, they are not realizing that his ideals still stand and young people have an interest to say, how can we work? How can we stop this? How can we fight this autocratic regime? How best can we build this legacy? So in killing Tulani, you know, they, they started a, a very serious movement of young lawyers, of, of young activists, of young women activists who also want to work. I mean, from grassroots in Swaziland, we also have um, the issue of illegal land grabs. So Tulani and myself, we're always on the ground with those victims who, who were evicted. We're always on the ground with different organizations and colleagues. So those victims of those evictions are now coming to say, how can we best help the Tulani Masego um, Foundation and amplify these voices? And how can we tell people the Swaziland story? Tell people that Swaziland, in as much as there's Gaza, there's, there's so many atrocities this is happening in Burkina Faso, in the DRC. How can we work together as Africans to make Africa a better place? So there's a, there's a, there's a lot of interest in terms of people in Swaziland, young people, more especially. You hear me, I keep on saying young people, young people, because mm -hmm. that is the future generation. And Tulani wanted the youth to be empowered. So the youth are actually asking how best can we um, work within the Tulani Masego Foundation to create a better Africa, to create to create a better Swaziland. So that is where we 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 find ourselves in work, work, work for better democracies, for human rights, for social justice, and the rule of law.
So that is where we are. I love the way you say that dictators and people like the king will never understand is that you can't you cannot kill the ideals and, and the dreams and, and the truth. Um, you, you can silence people, but you can never do that. And you can never silence these ideas. Ideas. That they are yeah. propagating. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So, so, so for me, I don't know what dictators, what, what kind of criteria they use. Because the more you kill, the more voices you create. Because we will definitely seek justice for Tulani. It will never stop right. until we get justice for Tulani, until we get justice for all the other victims that were killed in Swaziland. I mean, it will never stop. We want better societies. We demand good democracies. So if we don't ask for that, then who will? Tanali, how can, how can listeners on this podcast today, how can they learn more about your work, the foundation's work, and uh, what's coming next in Swaziland? Um, thank you very much for that question. Um, we are working on creating a website. I think it will be out by next week, a proper we website for the Tulani Masego Foundation. But I am on X at Tanele underscore Masego. I'm on Facebook and I'm on Instagram. So I'm in all um, the, 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 the platforms. But I, I, I think um, platforms like these podcasts are very critical in amplifying our voice. And I think, um, yes, um, I'm in different countries doing different things with different organizations. I mean, the HRF from time to time, they host me in Norway. So that's another way where I amplify my voice. I also work with, with uh, Southern Human Rights Defenders Network Network, another network for human rights defenders. I also work with uh, another organization called Africa Women Human Rights Defenders Initiative, where we drive um, issues of women, women human rights defenders in Africa. So I'm in different platforms, but I continue to do human rights work. I continue to amplify um, the voices of the people um, in Swaziland. So yes, that is me. That is where I am. Do you know what I think is really cool, Tanali? Is that yes. obviously, with the absolute power that he wields, uh, he you know crushes uh, and silences try the media as much as he can. You know, doing research on Swaziland sometimes it's hard to find current news because obviously. Mm -hmm. So I, I kind of like this idea that what I think is cool is what's coming out of Swaziland are voices like yours, and other young people, because um, we as we've already said they can't silence them. But while they're they're quashing the media, that's quiet. Your, mm. voice, your voice is louder. These young people's voices are louder. And yeah. we're going to do all that we can to, to promote those too. And, and speaking of, of, of your voice, Danelli, I've also been informed that you have an incredible singing voice. Now, I, I, we, won't, we won't ask you to sing right now. Maybe we'll save that for another episode. But again, just to, just to echo Alicia's point, to have your voice elevated even more because of everything that has taken place, your work, your husband's work, and again, these future generations rising in Swaziland, it's a beautiful thing. Um, I'm working on a beautiful song. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Go ahead, tease us. Actually, one of the struggle songs that we, we, we normally sing with young people, you know, before we start in any event, um, the song is, is, is it's just, it's the normal political song, but I'm working on adding, you know, different voices into it. It's called Freedom. And we call it was Angululego, you know, come freedom, come freedom, we yearn for you. It's a political song, yes, but I am just working on tweaking it a little bit. So do you want me to sing for you? Yes, <laughs> absolutely we do. One hundred percent. It says Wozangulego Sigulindi Le Gululego. Ungambula lutula gululego sigulindi ungambula lucheche ingulego sigulindi ungamtuli sumario gululego sigulindi osa gululego gululego sigulindi le. You just made my whole week beautiful. That just made my yes. whole week. 
<laughs> no one can see so me, but I'm smiling so big right now. <laughs> I can see you, Alicia. Yeah, it's smiling right. real big. Um, for freedom, who are waiting for you, freedom. You may kill to learn. You may have silenced uh, different political leaders. I'm, I'm naming one Labour leader, Chansi Tole. I'm naming another leader, Mario Masugu. They may, they may have died, but their spirit, their ideals, what they stood for, what they fought for, and what they died for, will continue with it. So that, that's what the song says. Beautiful. It says, "We're standing with you. We yearn for freedom. We want freedom." And Freedom, we see you. Freedom, you're coming. Just when I thought you couldn't get any more amazing, you pulled that out. So, uh, Alicia, I think <laughs> next episode we'll have you sing. Done. And then I'll start working yeah. some material as well. That's I mean, what the people want. We'll, we'll start with Stanley, go for the top, and then we'll go down. Absolutely, <laughs> absolutely. Diminishing returns. I guess we'll start, we'll start with Thor. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, Tanelli, this was wonderful having you on. Obviously, folks now know where they can follow your work and the Foundation's work. Um, so, we are so grateful for, for having you join us today. Obviously, not just for the song, but for everything that you do for uh, your work to continue your husband's legacy uh, and for the future of Swaziland. And, and really quickly, large. will we see you in Oslo, Norway for the, the, for the prize? Um, yes, I'm definitely coming. I'm definitely coming. Yes, okay. Wonderful. It's, can you tell us the name of the prize really quickly? Can it's the Tulani Masego Prize. It's the Tulani Masego Human Rights Prize. Beautiful. Beautiful. It's, and you'll be yes, handing out maybe? I'll be in Oslo. I'm coming, I'm yes. coming, I'm coming. We'll see you there then. <laughs> I'm so excited. <laughs> We're going to walk at the same pace. When we were in yes. Taiwan, our, um, we, were, we were going to dinner somewhere, and um, we're, we're slow walkers, and so people were trying to gallop. And she and I were back in the very back. Why, why are you guys taking off away from us? And so we were like, forget it. We'll walk by ourselves. We'll get there. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys. Thank you, really, for creating this platform. It, it, it really helps us human rights defenders in countries of distress where we talk about our issues, we talk about our, pro our programs, and where um, we seek and ask for solidarity. So this is a very important platform. Please do continue amplifying other voices. We really appreciate this pla uh, this platform. Thank you so much, colleagues. Tanelli, I'll say it before we let you go. I've said it too before, but I'll say it again. I think that you are wonderful. I think that you are fierce. I think you are so good at what you do. I think that Tulan would be so proud of the work that you carried on. Um, I hope in this he way. is. I hope he is. And I, I think really you're so brave. Is. I know. I have no doubt. Oh, absolutely he is. He'd be so proud. <laughs> Thanks, Thank you Tanelli. so much. Thank you so much, colleagues. And I mean, I hope this was very helpful. I hope next time we'll, we'll have more time and, you know, talk about the, the, the surveillance that is going on in the yes. country. You know, the strong surveillance, the physical surveillance. You see people following you. Um, political activists back home are also, you know, very skeptical on how they're doing their work. You know, the environment is not that conducive now because, you know, there is serious surveillance. So I think mm -hmm. um, the, the more we highlight these issues on what's happening in the country, I think um, it's the more we'll get solidarity and people, you know, seeking and wanting to help, seeking justice for us. And I think it, this is really good that you guys created this platform. So I really and truly appreciate the work that you guys are doing. Thank you so much. Thanks, Tanelli. We'll, we'll see you in Oslo. See you in Oslo. Thank you so much, guys. Bye. Bye. <laughs> Bye. Well, at least that was a great conversation. And, and, and I, I am serious. I am expecting your, your singing voice. All right. Sometime soon. Challenge accepted. I mean, I will work on some of my own Celine Dion, if you'd like, or... Well, I, I, I think I think Celine would be a great I one. I can't write as beautiful a song as that. No, no. But you know what they say about Harry Styles? <gasps> that, why didn't I even everybody. think of that? A songwriter for everybody. What, what do you uh, think you would say? But look, look well, just, I want to say best of the best. Tanelli is the best of yes. the best for so many things outside her singing voice. And it was such an honor to have her uh, with us today. She already uh, told folks where you can find more uh, from her on all the socials. Uh, and keep an eye open for uh, the new website being launched soon yeah, as well. That's going to be great. She's the best. She really is the best. And hopefully we'll see folks in Oslo in June 3rd to 5th. So they can Come see meet who Tanella wins yourself. the prize. Yes. As well. She's an absolute delight. And I just, I'm in awe of her spirit, especially in this last year. You know, she's just, uh, she's pretty cool. I think that is an understatement. <laughs> All right. All right, Casey Von well, uh, we do this. I know, I know as you like. Same bat time, same bat channel. Same bat time, same bat channel. All Keeping right. Gotham City safe. I Thanks, everyone. So. Bye. The Human Rights Foundation is a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization that promotes and protects human rights globally. 
with a focus on closed societies. We promote freedom where it's most at risk, in countries ruled by authoritarian regimes.